This is my favorite upcoming MMOs video I've made yet because we have recently received so many huge updates to some of the most exciting MMOs on this list. And some of these MMOs are coming out in less than a year. 2024 looks insane right now. Ashes of Creation will release its persistent alpha, Throne and Liberty, and multiple other MMOs are gonna be releasing their games in 2024. Multiple AAA studios will likely officially announce MMOs we already know that they're working on, and that's just scratching the surface of what 2024 has to offer. So let's get this list started. And if you want to be kept up to date on any of these MMOs, be sure to melee attack that sub button. For each of these games, I'm going to tell you about the latest updates as well as their release date and if they're going to be paid to win or not, because I know for a lot of you, that's a make or break factor. Now for Arcage 2, coming to PC and console. This is definitely one of the MMOs with the highest chance to do something special, but also perhaps the highest chance to smother that special game to death with over monetization. Arc Age 2 is developed by XL Games based out of South Korea and is scheduled for release right around the corner in 2024. There was some fantastic information tucked into the recent quarterly earnings report for Kakao Games. It tells us that a closed beta test will start in the first half of 2024. We also found out that Arc Age 2 will be a radical departure from its predecessors, moving away from large large-scale PvP between factions, and instead focusing on single-player content and guild versus guild content. Now, the coolest thing about Arc Age 2 is that it has some features we don't really see in other MMOs right now, such as Sea Warfare, which, if done right, could be a ton of fun. You may have noticed by the graphics, this is going to be another MMO built on Unreal Engine 5. There are a lot of UE5 MMOs in development right now, but none of the big ones have yet been released. Arc Age 2 also plans to allow players to build entire towns and customize them. So far, we know the game will feature humans and elves, and I'm looking forward to seeing what other races make it into the game. According to the developer, the game is going to feature a seamless open world, and if you've been following the progress of Ashes of Creation, you'll see some familiar features in Arc Age 2, as Ashes of Creation has drawn significant inspiration from Arc Age 1. The developers say they plan for Arc Age 2 to have action-packed combat, and so far from what we've seen, it reminds me a lot of BDO. They also said it's important for the game to have AAA visuals to take advantage of Unreal Engine 5's capabilities, and based on the early footage, it looks like they're really succeeding on that front. They're putting a lot of time and money into telling an immersive and compelling storyline this time around, and they're aiming to have a less linear progression and focus on more personal storytelling than Arc Age 1 did. The story of the game will portray Aurora when it was first discovered and people were first starting to settle there. The story will involve discovering and solving the mysteries of an ancient civilization that had been forgotten for thousands of years, leaving it to blend with the natural environment. Like I said last time, this kind of reminds me of the Dwemer from the Elder Scrolls franchise. The developer went on to acknowledge that Arc Age 1 had trade runs that were enjoyable but had many flaws. So in Arc Age 2, they plan to bring that system back and greatly enhance it. Players will be allowed to participate in these both alone or in teams. Like I said, this will probably remind you of Ashes of Creation's caravans, which they just revealed. And that's because where do you think Ashes got that idea from? They also pointed out that housing was a popular feature of the original title, so this time they'll be improved that and adding more customization as well as allowing players to live in towns with their friends and create their own towns with their guild members. We are now wrapping up 2023 and stepping into 2024 and this game is slated for a 2024 release date. Closed beta is scheduled for the first half of 2024 so very soon and more big news about the game is going to be announced at Gamescon 2024. I'm really excited for this one I just hope they don't ruin it with monetization. Now bear with me a second imagine it's 3 a.m it's pitch black you're lost you're naked and you're a Afraid. Your phone has 5% battery left. What do you do? That's right. You'd play Raid Shadow Legends, the sponsor of today's video. They're giving away Monkey King Legendary Sun Wukong for free. Raid almost never gives away heroes like this for free, so whatever you do, don't miss out. He's got special abilities like ones that allow him to steal all buffs from all enemies before attacking them, or my personal favorite, his passive that fully revives himself. According to Chinese mythology, the Monkey King is known for his ability to turn into 72 different things, including a tree. Look, I don't know why he can turn into a tree either, but I do know you can play Raid Shadow Legends for free using my link or by scanning the QR code on screen right now to get insane bonuses that are only available if you use my link. By using my link, you'll get two epic champions. First is the Light Sworn, the strong and epic champion from the Sacred Order. His kit allows you to keep a team alive with an increased defense buff and a revive on death skill. And second is Epic Juliana after reaching level 15. If you need bosses deleted, you want Juliana. She is from the Sacred Order and a great attack type warrior. After downloading with my link, use promo code MONKEYKING to get the third champion 
champion legendary Sun Wukong for free. This promo code is only available within the first 72 hours of registering after downloading the game using my special link. To redeem Raid Shadow Legends promo codes, tap on the tab on the top left side of the screen when in the Bastion, and then select Promo Codes option. Type the promo code Monkey King there. Don't miss this incredible opportunity to get not one, but two epics using my super exclusive link and receive the legendary Monkey King with a promo code. This legendary champion is an absolute game changer, setting you up for an unbeatable head start in raid. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the video. This next MMO is one of the most likely candidates to be a dominating force in the future of the MMO genre. The game is currently called Ghost and is being made by the United States based studio called Pixel Fantastic Castle. Or no, is it Fantastic Pixel Castle? That's a mouthful. We'll shorten this. Uh, we'll call it Fab Castle. There we go. Fixed it. According to the developers, this game will not be pay to win. Now, Fab Castle's new game has a ton of potential, but I do have one point of concern and one red flag to discuss. But before we talk about those, let's talk about what the game is going to be. The developers have said the game will feature the Holy Trinity. They think it works and it isn't something that needs to be reinvented. And I agree with this. An MMO never feels like an MMO when it doesn't have the Trinity. So many core components fall by the wayside from teamwork to strategy. Without the Trinity, it always ends up feeling like there just happens to be somewhere in the same instance as you killing things at the same time as you, as opposed to you defeating your enemies as a team. Fabcastle plans for Ghost to feature significant account-wide progression so that switching between alts feels good. Right now, they are thinking of having more skills on your bar than League of Legends and less than WoW, so somewhere between 5 and 50 skills on your bar. Fabcastle says they don't really want to do free-to-play with microtransactions. The three largest MMOs right now are sub-to-play for a reason. It works. And if you think free-to-play games cost less than sub to play games, boy do I have some graphs to show you. Now let's talk about one of the things that Fabcastle said that I didn't agree with, and that's that they are planning to have no auction house. This one scares me. I played Lineage 2, you had to set up a shop to buy and sell things and leave your character there. EverQuest had something similar in the early 2000s. This is something I don't miss, and I think they're overthinking this one. Auction houses are not only okay, but they're great as long as they aren't a shortcut to the best gear. That's pretty easily solved by making most best in slot and pre best in slot items find on pickup. You don't need to get rid of the entire auction house. Fabcastle's art style won't be as cartoony as WoW, and they're going for a more mature look, but not so realistic that it doesn't stand the test of time as the game ages. They said that they're looking to have a hybrid tab target action combat system. And the next fact is really interesting. They plan on the game having 20 to 50 classes. Yes, you heard that right, 20 to 50. But it sounds like the depth of those classes would be kind of like saying classic WoW has 27 classes. Rather than giving one class three specs, they'd break that class into three different classes, so 21 classes in Ghost might equate to seven or fewer classes in WoW. Fabcastle wants the game to be alt friendly, and they expect a lot of content to come from replaying it on different classes. They plan to have a shard system where there will be blue shards and red shards. The blue shards would take you to a more private zone or instance for you and your friends, and would play more like a survival game, with a bit of procedural generation sprinkled in to make sure you never see the same blue shard twice. The red shard would be more of your standard MMO zone zone with a more traditional MMO feel. These would be handcrafted and contain world bosses and raids. Most everything about the game sounds great right up until this shard system, which starts to make the game sound like it's going to be a hub based multiplayer game instead of an open world MMO. I'll be really bummed if they had the hub route. I prefer seamless zones in MMORPGs like in WoW or in New World, and we have no shortage of hub based games to choose from already. But let me ask you, humble viewer, yes, you, is your dream MMO a seamless open world or is it one with load screens between each zone. Let me know in the comments. As for races in the game, it sounds like they want to move away from elves and orcs to something new and different. I don't mind elves and orcs, but I'm also fine with new and different. As for the potential red flag, Fabcastle's website says, and I quote, don't worry about excessive gotcha mechanics. Endless loot boxes pay to win or the like. Now, it doesn't say don't worry about gotcha. It says don't worry about excessive gotcha. It doesn't say don't worry about loot boxes. It says don't worry about endless loot boxes. Are these qualifiers the innocent result of poor wording or are they intentionally leaving the door open for gotcha and loot boxes to be part of their DNA? After all, they are being financed by netties. Greg gives off the vibes of someone who meant the former and not the latter, but I've been hurt by so many MMOs before, I couldn't help but notice the wording. Now, perhaps the most important bit of information. When will this game be released? 
Ghostcrawler said MMOs typically take five to 10 years, but he is hoping for Fap Castle to make Ghost in four to six years. Suffice it to say, it's very early. All of this is subject to change. And if you have an opinion on something, say so. Give your feedback loud and clear now while it's early in development and they can still pivot. As for me, my two cents as a longtime MMO degenerate, we, the MMO players, don't need anything revolutionary. We just need a modern version of a classic seamless open world MMO. You create that with pure monetization where the rewards are in the game and not at the cash shop and you literally can't fail. If for no other reason, then there isn't a single other studio with the confidence to try it. Next up, we have Arc 2 coming to PC and console. This game is not going to be pay to win. In fact, Wildcard Studios is actually known for hating pay to win and hating microtransactions. So hey, that's awesome. Initially scheduled for 2022, but now planned for the end of 2024, Arc 2 is yet another game that is right around the corner. This game is coming from Studio Wildcard based out of the United States. Take the release date with a grain of salt though, as hitting their deadlines isn't exactly something they're known for. As you may remember, Vin Diesel is attached to this game thanks to the fact that he was a massive fan of Arc 1. But there's one thing Vin Diesel likes more than Arc 1, and that's sequels. So, Arc 2 and Vin Diesel seem the perfect match. Vin Diesel will play the protagonist Santiago, who was ejected from an exploding spaceship onto the alien planet that Arc 2 takes place on. Arc 2 is planned to feature substantial changes from its predecessor. For example, they plan to feature souls like melee combat, where you can target lock, dodge, combo, or stagger your enemy. Apparently, Arc 2 will also have a heavier focus on primitive only weaponry and is changing from first person to a strict third person view for character traversal systems such as sliding, swing, free climbing, mantling, parkour, and more. Arc 2 is set in a massive new alien environment with dynamic world events. You'll be able to craft weapons and tools with tons of combinations between the appearance and their function. Arc 2 developers say they're going to fully support the modding scene as they've determined that some of the best content Arc 1 had to offer was the content the community created. Arc 2 is planned for PC and Xbox and is slated for Game Pass. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw it head to PlayStation after a short exclusivity with Xbox, but we'll see. We have seen very little of the game outside of trailers, so there's still a lot of unknowns for a game that's scheduled to release in less than a year. I hope they hit their release date of 2024, but due to how little we know, I'm not totally optimistic that is going to happen. Next up, we have Taurus Land coming to mobile and PC. Is it gonna be pay to win? You betcha. This one is an interesting one that popped up from Chinese developer Level Infinite. The game is surrounded in controversy right now as it has decided it was no longer going to be free of pay to win, going as far as removing all promotional material that said the game would not have pay to win. Another decision that won't be received well here in the West is that the game is also intending to feature a mobile inspired stamina system where the amount of things you can craft is time gated. And if you want to do more crafting, you've got to swipe your credit card to do so. I think this game may do well in China and it may even do well on mobile here in the West because there aren't a lot of quality modern mobile MMOs on offer. What do you think? Is this one that you're looking forward to? Next up, we have Lord of the Rings coming to PC and possibly console. It is unlikely this one will be pay to win. And while it's very early in development for this one, Amazon Game Studios based out of the United States will be developing this one. This might sound familiar because Amazon had previously tried to develop a Lord of the Rings MMO, but that fell through when some of their agreements with another publisher fell through. Amazon has said that they plan to be authentic to the source material and that it will be made by the same dev team that made New World, which does make me wonder about New World's content schedule going forward, but that's a topic for another video. It sounds like they plan to make the world massive and seamless, just like New World or WoW, and that is great news for me. I'm getting tired of load screen simulators that call themselves open world. And yes, they will be using the same Azoth engine that New World uses, but they do plan to evolve the engine considerably so that it will not feel like New World with a Lord of the Rings paint job. This is honestly fine with me. I thought New World did a lot of things really well. Climbing, mantling, gathering, zone, design, and scale, all without a load screen. As you run from one end of the game to the other, there were a lot of positives to be had in New World, though I do hope we see the ability to swim added to the engine for Lord of the Rings. If I have to watch my elf walk on the river floor when this game launches in 2032, I'll be big sad. If you're worried about this game ending up like New World, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is that New World was initially developed to be a survival game. It was never meant to be what it is today, and it was a turbulent path to pivot the game in this direction at the last second before its scheduled launch. That pivot is why the game felt so unfinished when it did finally launch. 
In the end, they did succeed in turning New World into a pretty good MMO. So this has me excited for Lord of the Rings. If they have a clear vision for the story and the questing and the dungeons and raids from the beginning, and they spend the entire development cycle working towards that end, I think this game is going to be a home run. A massive open world MMO in a seamless world without load screens and heaps of Lord of the Rings lore? It's just gonna be really hard to fail here. Unfortunately, this is very early in development, but there is a silver lining. Because it's an experienced team and they are reusing the Azoth engine, its development timeline should be significantly reduced. Still, an optimistic timeline would be to see a playable beta in at least four years. So, thank God for the other MMOs on this list. If you like the video, consider liking, subscribing, or leaving a comment. It helps way more than you know. Thanks. Hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Next, we have Quinfall coming to PC. Pay to win? Well, we don't know. There's not a lot known about this developer yet because it's brand new. Quinfall is being developed by a Turkish studio, founded in 2021, and for a game that is so young, it looks to be impressively far along in its development. Maybe. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's an open world sandbox MMO with an action combat system built in the Unity engine. In Quinfall, you will visit dungeons and explore the world to uncover its mysteries. It sounds like you'll have to solve puzzles and look for hidden paths. The game is planned to include 11 different professions that you can level up. You'll be able to plant seeds and farm the land. The professions will synergize with one another. Cooking will provide meals that give you special powers for various fields. You can fish or tame animals or extract resources from trees, plants, ores throughout the world. You can level up hunting by hunting animals. You can improve your mounts by finding better ones or by breeding mounts together. You can build homes and decorate them. You'll be able to build a ship and sail out to sea. While at sea, you'll be able to encounter and battle sea creatures or other players. Seasons are going to affect gameplay with floods and droughts among other things. It sounds like you'll be able to choose if you want to play in a PVE or PVP server. We just found out that they plan to launch a closed beta on January 30th, 2024. Although they did say that it would be limited to select players, whatever that means. Now all of this looks good for a studio that was just founded three and a half years ago. But when I look at the fact that the game features time travel in this medieval world also has a steam engine, airships and mech robots and the entire arcade sailing system. I don't know, I've seen too many MMOs with these kind of promises that ended up delivering a disappointing mess. So for right now, I'm gonna keep an eye on this one, but I'm not expecting too much from it just yet. I'll be surprised if the game's able to deliver on everything it's promised in a meaningful way, but it sounds like we'll find out very soon. All right, next up we have Odyssey from Blizzard. This is going to be a massively multiplayer survival RPG. Five years into development now, this one is going to be more of a multiplayer survival game than a traditional MMORPG, but it is going to have a lot of MMO elements and a deep story attached to it. It seems like it would have been an easy home run to make a online survival game in the Warcraft universe, but I have a feeling Blizzard didn't because they seem acutely aware of the fact that perhaps the only thing that can kill WoW is Blizzard itself, so it's unlikely they'll release anything remotely similar to WoW until it's no longer the most popular MMORPG in the world. Which makes sense. Why compete with yourself, I guess? So what do we know about this massive multiplayer survival game? It's said that the game will be multi-platform, and with Microsoft now owning Blizzard, that means it's coming to PC and Xbox. It sounds like this game will be a combination of survival games like Valheim and Rust, but much more of an emphasis on the story. Also, unlike Valheim, it's going to take place in a permanent online world. It sounds like it's very much going to be a first-person shooter oriented game, or at the very least, feature first-person shooter elements. Their hiring page is looking for people with a love for survival-based games and shooters in general. Other hiring posts ask for someone who would lead the team to build a AAA first-person shooter open-world multiplayer space. Their posting said they want to ensure it feels amazing to build things together with other players. The growth of shared social spaces as aspirational and satisfying and that the result of what players build together is a beautiful reflection of their accomplishments. So basically, it sounds like building a base together is going to be a massive part of this online survival game. Perhaps most interestingly, among the MMO elements slipping into this game is that it will have dungeons and raids. So while it sounds like it's going to be a first-person shooter survival game, it's also got these signs of a MMORPG woven into it. So at the very least, it's going to be an MMO light. The game, of course, plans to feature survival game basics like chopping down trees for materials. In their job posting, they asked, what would Blizzard grade tree chopping entail? And how would they make it fun for 10,000 hours? I'm just telling you right now, there's pretty much no way you're gonna get me to chop trees for 10,000 hours. Just a heads up, Blizzard. 
the game is absolutely going to contain PvP. It sounds like there will be PvP style spaces like Battlegrounds, as well as open world locations where PvP encounters will take place naturally as players clash over valuable resources. Considering it's a Blizzard title, we can expect the game to be buy to play with a season pass and a cosmetic shop. They'll probably make you pay $99 to play the game on launch day, while the people who buy the base game start the game three or four days later, similar to how they handled the launch of Diablo or the next WoW expansion. The silver lining is that while Blizzard's monetization has been getting increasingly more aggressive, they have avoided going full on pay to win in their games. So, hey, at least there's that. They have not yet officially announced Odyssey, so my eyes are on BlizzCon 2024 or even perhaps some kind of 2024 Xbox event, seeing as how Microsoft owns Blizzard now. As soon as we get any more information about this game, I'll be sure to post it on this channel. So be sure to subscribe. Next up, we've got Horizon Online from NCSoft and Sony, which is going to be coming to PC and PlayStation. Will this be beta win? I don't know. It's got NCSoft, who is typically pay to win these days, and then it's got Sony. So I'm not sure how monetization is going to land when those two make a game together. To say the least, it's fascinating to me that Sony and NCSoft are working together to make a Horizon Online video game. Right now, it sounds like this is going by the name Project H. These two teaming up could be the perfect marriage. NCSoft stated that they have an internal development team working on the title. Negotiations on this have concluded and development has begun, so it sounds like this is actually happening. You have to imagine that since this is an important franchise for Sony, Sony would keep the monetization of the MMO, let's say, above board, more so than NCSoft titles have come to be known for in recent years, which means we could see a title that has NCSoft quality, Sony lore, and Sony monetization. That's a combination of things I could be on board with. The Horizon franchise has been heralded as one of the best out there, and its world really does lend itself to an MMO type setting. Seeing as this MMO was just announced a year ago, I'm going to assume that it's probably at least a solid five or six years from release. But I've got to be honest, I didn't see this MMO or this partnership coming. But in a lot of ways, I think it makes perfect sense, and I'm excited to find out more about it. Next up, we have Project LLL from NCSoft. Will this be pay to win? Well, it's NCSoft, so it's definitely likely, although that hasn't been confirmed yet. The footage of this game so far looks a lot like Destiny meets Titanfall meets some kind of alien invasion. We finally got some new gameplay footage of this beautiful Unreal Engine 5 game, and that's what you're seeing now. This game will feature PvE and PvP encounters, as well as dynamic events throughout the world. The game looks like it's got a really dark and gritty sci-fi side to it, which has definitely piqued my interest. It was also announced that the game has a vast open world in which more than 30 square kilometers of land is seamlessly connected to a single environment. The developers have described this game as having much more of an open world feel as opposed to its primary competitor, probably Destiny, which has a lot more of a lobby based feel to it. And to put 30 square kilometers into perspective, that's about the same size as Breath of the Wild or Grand Theft Auto V. Based on the gameplay we saw, there appears to be a lot of sci-fi and horror elements, grotesque enemies, a mega boss of some sort that appears to be made of a thousand arms. I didn't see any quote unquote magic like you'd see in a traditional MMO. More so, we saw a character utilize rockets fired over his shoulder from a backpack gadget, a jetpack for jumping to higher places, and even some kind of shield to protect him from incoming enemy fire. But by far, the most common weapon used was the rifle, which was used to take down 90% of the enemies in the video. So it looks like this is definitely a shooter first and foremost. Given that it is an MMO, I do wonder how many classes it might have. Will it have abilities? Is it entirely gear based? Will we have passives? There's a lot to learn still. All in all, I think this is a pretty cool world. It looks like it's got a dark and gritty feel to it. The gunplay looks like it feels solid and it looks like it's very much in a playable state, which means we'll likely see this one release a lot sooner than most of the MMOs on this list. Next up, we've got Soul Frame from Digital Extremes. This game is coming to PC and console. Will this game be pay to win? I'm not sure yet. My best guess is that they'll monetize it a lot like they do Warframe, which is the sister game to this game. We didn't know a lot about this game until Tenocon this year, which showed us about 17 minutes of actual gameplay. I watched it live and it was amazing. The combat looked exciting and well paced. The visuals were fantastic, but the music, the music really stood out as something special. It looks to me like it'll be an MMO in the way that Warframe is an MMO, perhaps more co-op than massively multiplayer, but we'll have to wait and find out. The plan is for it to be a fantasy, magic heavy, 
MMORPG. Much more of your typical melee and magic type of universe than Warframe sci-fi gun heavy universe. The fight that they showed us had old Dark Souls vibes to it, kind of eerie, mysterious, and beautiful all at the same time. It sounds like you'll change packs in Soul Frame in the way that you change frames in Warframe. Doing so will change your skills. The world and the dungeons that we've seen so far look stunning, and I really can't wait to see more. It's worth noting that I haven't seen anything in the way of the Trinity, that is tank, healer, and DPS. So if this ends up being a game where everyone is a DPS, I think Soul Frame is likely going to scratch your Warframe itch a lot more than it scratches your classic MMORPG itch, like WoW, Final Fantasy, ESO, or Guild Wars. As of now, they've given no indication of what the monetization model will be, other than that it will be free to play. So if they monetize it like they do Warframe, that means it'll be pay to advance faster with pay for cosmetics. Warframe was a game that has a lot of polish and some incredibly outlandish ideas that really paid off. Digital Extremes was never afraid to try things that I had never seen in any other game before. Of all the games on this list, this is easily one of the most likely to succeed and thrive. Because of the team that's working on this and their familiarity with the engine and the quality of what we've seen so far, I'm expecting really big things from this game. I'll definitely be posting more updates about this one as we find out more. Next up, we've got a Dune MMO from Funcom. This one's going to PC and console, so you'll be able to play this on PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and it's being made in Unreal Engine 5. Will this game be pay to win? I don't think so. Back in 2019, Funcom announced that they were working on a Dune MMO, but this year we finally got more information about what it was going to be. The director of the game describes it as a survival, open world, massively multiplayer game. Players are invited to explore the world of Dune and involve themselves with politics, intrigue, and finding a way to survive together on the most dangerous planet in the universe. Sounds epic. He also says that when Dune Awakening begins, you're a castaway in the deep desert and all you'll have is a knife that you crafted from scrap metal. You'll have to use this and only this to sneak up on enemy camps and eliminate enemies to better arm yourself. By the time you hit endgame, you'll be part of a big guild that has a fleet of vehicles such as ornithopters, sand bikes, and tanks that you use to head out to collect spice in the desert, which is where you'll undoubtedly clash with enemy guilds. And where there's noise in the desert, there are sandworms. While playing Dune, you'll have to learn how to survive sandstorms and manage your precious and incredibly limited water supply. Dune Awakening combines the grittiness and creativity of survival games with the social interactivity of large-scale persistent multiplayer games to create a unique and ambitious open-world survival MMO. This is the developer that made Conan Exiles, which is described as an online multiplayer survival game with mounts and mounted combat set in the lands of Conan the Barbarian. And there seems to be a lot of overlap between these two games. It sounds like Dune is going to be the more ambitious version of Conan Exiles that takes place in the Dune universe instead of the Conan universe. Instead of dozens of players on the server, Dune will have thousands. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in a game where you are meant to gather materials and build a base to defend yourself from other players and the wilderness. Right now, I'm totally picturing a guild-centric rust, but in the desert with a giant sandworm roaming around trying to kill me. The best materials and ingredients I'm assuming will be deeper into the desert, farther from the safety of my fort, so I'll likely spend a lot of time upgrading my vehicles and my still suit to venture farther into the desert without dying. Of course, the primary resource in this game will be spice, which you'll spend much of your time seeking out. But remember, as mentioned earlier, the sandworm won't be your only threat, much like rust or Conan Exiles, other players will also be seeking out these valuable resources and will likely try to kill you to take yours. If you do manage to succeed in your hunt for spice, you'll be able to consume the spice to conquer your senses and acquire powerful abilities. We still don't know what these abilities will be, but that is something I'm very curious about. Fittingly, if you consume too much spice, you'll become addicted to it, but we don't know what the consequences of that will be yet. Beyond that, you'll also be able to hone your crafting for financial gain, as well as construct a fortress in the style of your choosing. I love that they're describing it as a fortress. This means that whatever you're building is going to be massive. Dune looks like it's going to be a real solid entry for players looking for a PvP centric MMO. So far, it sounds like the PvE player's mileage might vary with this one, but we'll have to wait and see what kind of PvE the game has to offer and if there will be enough of it to keep the PvE player engaged. Throne and Liberty. Pay to win? Likely. It's NCSoft. Throne and Liberty is a AAA MMORPG set to be released on PS5 and PC in 2023 in the East and 2024 in the West. NCSoft recently partnered with Amazon Game Studios to have them publish the game here in the West. Throne and Liberty has had about as a turbulent a development cycle as you can imagine. This thing's been in development for something like 13 years, and when it came into beta, it was meant to have auto-pathing, auto-play, offline play, and pretty much every bad idea you could implement into a single MMO. 
This seems likely the result of the fact that early on there were plans for this game to be playable on mobile, but that's been scrapped for now. As of right now, Throne and Liberty will be a PC and console MMO. Autoplay and offline play have been removed. All of these changes are the result of a horribly received beta, and I mean, it didn't go well. Player reaction to the game was so bad that even the stock price of the developer took a hit. But to NCSoft's credit, they listened to the community and they have made some massive changes to the fundamentals of the game as a result of the player feedback. Now, all of a sudden, the game looks like it could be pretty good. And they've said that they're choosing a non pay to win monetization model and they're thinking of doing something like a battle pass. If Throne in Liberty ends up being a solid MMO and it's not pay to win, I can see a lot of players enjoying this in the East and in the West, which is exciting to think about. Throne in Liberty is the spiritual successor to Lineage 2. In fact, Throne in Liberty was originally going to be the next Lineage game, but in writing the story for the game, NCSoft realized it would be best served as an entirely new IP. As someone who put quite a few hours in Lineage 2 and Lineage 2 Classic, I'm really looking forward to giving this game a chance, especially if it's not pay to win. The game will feature non-instance dungeons that you can head into and explore alongside groups of other players. I absolutely love the amount of mobility that it looks like they've integrated into Throne and Liberty. Between the grapple hook, the gliding, and the transformations, getting around the world should be a lot of fun. The game plans to play differently between day and night as well as when it's rainy or sunny. Even skills and abilities will perform differently based on the weather. Throne in Liberty looks like it will feature siege battles. These siege battles look like they will be a significant part of the game, much like they were in Lineage 2. Apparently, even siege battles will be impacted by the rain. For instance, certain passages into the castle will not be available if it's raining because they'll be flooded. Back in Lineage 2, the guilds that would win the siege battle would end up controlling the castle and the town for a week or two, usually profiting heavily until it was allowed to be sieged again, at which point they would have to defend it to maintain it. It was a massive part of the game, and the spread out nature of the siege schedule allowed for a nice balance between PvE and PvP content. It's going to be interesting to see how much of the PvP in Throne and Liberty is inspired by the Lineage 2 siege system, and that's something that it's going to have in common with Ashes of Creation. In this game, the player is going to be highly mobile with the ability to grapple onto objects and services of varying heights. This should allow for excellent verticality in the zone design and should pair brilliantly with the ability to use gliders. NCSoft has the ability to make great MMOs, but also finds themselves succumbing to that sweet, sweet temptress named over monetization. That's given NCSoft a bad reputation in the West over the years, so here's hoping they can change that reputation with Throne and Liberty. If not, there are a lot of other great MMOs on this list that players will be more than happy to play instead. One such game might be Ashes of Creation. Will this game be pay to win? No. Is it going to mobile? No. Slated to release sometime in 2075, this MMO is looking very promising. Okay, I'm joking. It's not slated for 2075. Or is it? We don't know because they still haven't provided any kind of timeline for the game's full release. This game is being developed by Intrepid, a young studio located in the United States. This MMO got some exciting news this year when they announced that Alpha 2 would go live in 2024. Until now, we didn't have a firm date for that. We don't know exactly what day it's going to go live in 2024, just that it'll be in 2024. This is significant because Alpha 2 will be persistent, so servers should be kept up all the time, and as I understand it, it will not be under NDA, so players will be able to share their experiences with the public during Alpha 2. Ashes of Creation is definitely one of the most exciting MMOs on the horizon. It's a massive MMO featuring a beautiful, seamless world and is set to release on PC with no current plans for console and definitely not coming to mobile. As of right now, we've got no official release date, but despite that, we know a lot more about this game than almost any other game on this list because the developers have been so transparent in the entire process of development. And unlike a lot of the games on this list, Ashes of Creation already had a very public and very successful Alpha 1 back in July of 2021, where players were allowed to play and stream and make content about the state of the game so far. This year, they showed off Mage gameplay, which looks fantastic, by the way. It also had a big freehold update, which is the real space housing system in the game. You can craft, hard and do all sorts of cool things in your freehold. Recently, they showed off the caravan system, which looks like it's going to be a fantastic way to encourage player versus player altercations that keep the PvP community busy. So far, it looks like this MMO has a far better chance of turning out to be real than a lot of UE5 MMOs being announced as of late. Ashes of Creation defines loot boxes, XP potions, and inventory problems as pay to win. As I always say when I'm talking about Ashes of Creation, it's a massive breath of fresh air. 
It looks like the monetization of Ashes of Creation is going to be 100% above board. This is just one more reason I think it stands a fantastic chance of succeeding where its predecessors have failed and is one of the major reasons I'm rooting for it. The best skins are going to be earned in game and if I understand it correctly, weapon cosmetics won't be sold in the cash shop. You'll have to earn your weapons by playing the game. The game will be sub to play with no box purchase necessary. Combine this with a beautiful world, traditional MMO design and ambitious scope and you can instantly see why Ashes of Creation is currently one of the most anticipated MMOs today. It will feature the holy trinity of tank, healer, and DPS. Combat can be a make or break feature for this genre, but after seeing the archer, the mage, and the cleric gameplay, I'm incredibly excited to see what they have planned for the rest of the classes. AOC isn't simply building a better version of what came before it, it's also got some innovative features including things like plans to have a dynamic world that changes based on player behavior, specific nodes can be upgraded to unlock new content and new resources based on player activity in that area, which means that every server could look completely different from another server. Which nodes have metropolises on them and which nodes are wilderness is going Going to be decided by the players. If a community upgrades a node enough, they might uncover a dungeon or a raid that previously wasn't available. I really hope that in spite of this game's open production, they manage to hide some of the mystery so that it's not a solved puzzle when it releases. As of right now, Ashes of Creation is a long way into its development, but I'd guess it's still at least three years from being complete. It's worth noting that it really does feel like Intrepid has ramped up their progress over the last couple of years with one incredible live stream after another and lots of details to complement those streams. Ashes of Creation is one of the more unique and interesting and most to follow on this list, but it's always on PvP is going to break a lot of PvE hearts when it comes out. Next up, we have Riot's League of Legends MMO. Will this MMO be pay to win? I don't think so, but we don't know a lot about this one yet. One of the few details that's been made public about this MMO is the fact that Greg Street has left. He was the lead on it and he quit and then started his own studio to make his own MMO. Does this mean his vision of what a great MMO would be and Riot's vision were not aligned? I guess time will tell when we eventually see the two final products. It's exciting to think that any of the MMOs on this list could be the next one to capture the genre the way that WoW did in its prime, but Riot's track record so far definitely suggests that it is one of the most likely candidates to succeed. One one interesting thing of note is that while Riot and Fab Castle are both studios located in the United States, they're both owned and financed by Chinese gaming giants Tencent and NetEase. Will we see Chinese monetization models leak into these MMOs? Time will tell. One thing is for sure, Riot's MMO will launch to massive audiences, as its fans have long been waiting for another reason to dive into the League of Legends universe. A lot of what we know about the game was taken directly from the Twitter account of Greg Street, aka Ghostcrawler. In one interview, he mentioned that he felt like he could make the free-to-play model Model work. Over at his new studio, he said he was leaning towards a sub to play model. This might be one of the fundamental differences in the design philosophy between Fab Castle's MMO and Riot's MMO, because we know that Riot most likely wants to make their MMO free to play. And as I said from the beginning, I do wonder how Riot will offer an MMO with a compelling in-game reward structure while also making it free to play. Typically, the rewards are the first thing that the cash shop cannibalizes in free to play MMOs. And for that same reason, they almost never last very long. First, the cash shop adds a cool weapon weapon skin, then it adds the best weapon skin, then it adds a cool mount, then it adds the best mount. It's been a long time since I saw a new MMO avoid this pitfall, and I'm really hoping to see Riot avoid this mistake. If they do go free to play as he seemed to insinuate in his discussion, it'll be fascinating to see what innovative approach they take here. It's confirmed that Runeterra will have raids and dungeons. A significant PvE presence does not mean a lack of PvE, however, as Ghostcrawler confirmed that PvP will be in the game, and they do see a future that includes epic PvP battles and possibly even esports. The MMO genre in general has struggled to create and maintain a PvP scene for some time now, so it'll be exciting to see how Riot approaches this piece of the puzzle. One of Greg's most interesting comments from January of 22 was when he asks about tab targeting, and he said that he thought combat in the genre was dated, and if we combine that information with a job posting seeking an action combat designer, it looks like Riot's MMO is going to feature action combat. You can also expect the MMO to feature a lot more cartoony or stylized graphics than Ashes of Creation, and it's confirmed that the game will have the Holy Trinity. Oh, and don't worry, fishing was also confirmed. As of March 22, they said the dungeon party size would be 6. This sounds pretty healthy as it allows for a tank, a healer, as well as 
four DPS, which would be great for keeping the DPS queues short. If you've ever queued a DPS in almost any MMO, you know how long those wait times can be. Greg said they weren't trying to reinvent MMOs. They want to make something familiar while innovating a little bit where it makes sense. Riot's MMO plans to make racist cosmetics so that you can focus on making your character look the way you want it. Now, remember, this doesn't mean that you're losing a choice. It just means that that choice is going to take place somewhere where it doesn't dictate how your character looks. As of right now, we have no idea when Riot's MMO will be released, but based on other games in the category, a four to seven year window seems reasonable, which would make it due to release sometime between 2025 and 2028. Every year I talk about that game, it's getting a little bit closer. Next up, we have Zoss's new MMORPG. Will this one be pay to win? Unlikely. Is it going to be on mobile? Also unlikely. This one's pretty interesting. ZeniMax Online Studios, the developers of Elder Scrolls Online, is working on what appears to be multiple projects, and one of which is an MMO. We still have hardly any information other than what we've been able to scrape from their job hiring page. All we know is that their creative directors worked on multiple games, including Battlefield and a space game, and that their lead level designer, Colin Campbell, worked on games like Mass Effect Andromeda, Star Wars Battlefront, and Jedi Fallen Order. We also know that ZeniMax put out posting asking for people with experience building all types of MMO systems. Their hiring page says that they learned a lot making ESO and that they're planning to make an entirely new IP. Now, does this mean it's a new IP for Zoss or does this mean it's an IP that literally didn't exist before this project? That's an important question and we'll talk about why in a second. All we know so far is that it's definitely not going to be ESO 2. One of the positions they had listed was a vehicle specialist, so it seems this MMO will take place in an era where vehicles of some sort exist. Now let's jump into the rumor mail because it's pretty fascinating. There's rumors that Zoss was working on some kind of Star Wars project, but those rumors were never officially confirmed. What we know is ZeniMax Online Studios, the makers of Elder Scrolls Online, has been working on a new unannounced project since at least 2018, and it was confirmed in 2019. That's about it. They've recently reiterated that they have over 200 people working on the game, spread all over the world, with a team of 50 working directly under the game director, Ben Jones. They have described it as grand and massive and benefiting from their experience making ESO. The game will have vehicles. They have hired people with experience with space-themed things, and the rumor mills are suggesting some kind of space-related game. They are now about six years into their development, so with the average MMO taking five to seven years to develop, you can assume that they'll be announcing this MMO any day now. And 2024 is looking like a prime time to do it. It's already going to be a big year for Zoss as they'll be celebrating the 10 year anniversary of Elder Scrolls Online. This MMO from ZeniMax is definitely one of the most likely to succeed, and I can't wait to find out more about it. But I better wrap this video up here. I have a few more MMOs that I was thinking about talking about on this list, but this video is already really long. But the rest of these MMOs on the list were going to be MMOs that were coming to PC and mobile. And as we know, when an MMO comes to PC and mobile, it's usually a mobile game ported to PC, not a PC game ported to mobile. So maybe I'll make a separate list for mobile MMOs in a separate video so that this one isn't two hours long. What do you think? Which MMO are you most excited for? Which one do you think has the best chance of doing something great? Let me know down in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and you want to be kept up to date on the development of these MMOs. Massive shout out to my YouTube channel members for supporting the channel so that I can bring you the best quality content possible. If you want to become a member for channel badges, access to private Discord channels, and behind the scenes footage, click the join button down below. And don't forget to check out the sponsor of today's video raid shadow legends be sure to use my link in the description for exclusive rewards if you're not sure what to do next consider one of these mmo videos popping up on screen right now